as I say, these are all about the American family and, and their problems today and how government can help and how government can hurt. And uh, I think that you are, uh, have spoken to this issue before, and I'd just like to put it all together in one interview, in a sense. Uh, in your view, Mr. President, what's happening to the American family today? You read uh, more and more about children being raised in a climate of divorce. Uh, there are more and more one-parent families. Uh, there are more and more children going to daycare centers out of the direct care of the mother who has to work or whatever. Is the government doing something wrong, or is this just the way society is going? Is there anything government can do to bring the family and keep the family together? Well, yes, I think in a number of things. Uh, first of all, while it was not aimed directly at the family, the government policies that led us to down the road of excessive inflation, mm -hmm. uh, excessive taxes, and that thus impoverished families to the point that uh, uh, both members, both parents uh, found it necessary to work uh, if they were going to provide the things they believed their children should have. Mm -hmm. uh, this had an effect on a great many families. I think there are other things that are not so much just the government, but uh, in this modern time there have been trends that have uh, reduced family values in many people's minds. Mm -hmm. But the The government can be of help in this and is being of help now in such things as we almost have doubled the tax credit for working mothers mm -hmm. for uh, child care facilities. Through our private sector initiatives department here, we're working with employers throughout the country and holding seminars and more employers are now putting in day center center facilities mm -hmm. uh, for the children of their, their workers. This uh, could wind up being the best kind of daycare because then the mother would have an opportunity, a chance during the day and the working day and so forth to at least get in and out and see her child and uh, that would be better than just the purely institutional mm -hmm. care that goes with so many daycare centers. Uh, Mr. President, the, uh, uh, you know, we hear, you hear a lot of, from critics and so forth about uh, we need more government aid for abortion and uh, more government aid for birth control and things like that. Uh, but I'm wondering if you feel that there are enough people speaking up for the family that wants to nurture life rather than to end it. In other words, the whole business of uh, helping people adopt children and being able to, uh, uh, to associate the government with that kind, that side of the equation as well as the other side. I, I really do believe that. This, um, uh, this is where the government, uh, if there's a way for the government to be involved, and I think there, uh, there are ways where we could be helpful in that, to uh, add to what is going on at the purely volunteer effort throughout our country, and mm -hmm. I don't underestimate that. It's magnificent. But to, uh, to recognize that there are probably a million, a million and a half uh, people in this country that can't have children and want them and are on waiting lists to adopt uh, abortion mm -hmm. is not the answer uh, to their problem. The answer to their problem would be facilities, uh, a helping hand to uh, say a young girl that's gotten in trouble and that now chooses the abortion route, uh, make it more possible uh, and to help in that child, her child, to be born and be adopted, mm -hmm. take care of her in her time of trouble. Mm -hmm. And, it, and uh, a, a life alternative for, for, for people who want to uh, choose that route to balance the equation better, is what you're yes. saying. Uh, Mr. President, people, uh, some people advocate teaching sex education in the schools, uh, and because you have uh, been prominent in your support of school prayer, your political position on school prayer is well known and astute. Uh, but do you think that there is a, a level of sex education that needs to be taught in the schools? Well, now, let me answer that in two. I don't think my position on school prayer is, uh, is well known. As a matter of fact, uh, it failed of the two-thirds majority it needed because a number of senators whom I talked to personally were convinced that 
a yes vote would have meant the federal government mandating the schools mm -hmm. that they would have to have prayers. Mm -hmm. And they were sincerely and honestly concerned, well, who's going to write those prayers? What we were advocating and the bill that we presented did nothing of the kind. I don't know how this distorted view got around. My view on school prayer is that the government is supposed to be neutral with regard to prayer because the government is neither to advocate nor to prevent religious practice. Mm -hmm. And all that we were asking was that the Constitution be interpreted, as I believe it really reads, to say that if someone wants to have prayer in school, they can have prayer in school. Now, so much for that. Now, to get down to sex education, in my present capacity, it doesn't matter much what I may feel about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think the federal government should have a part in that. Mm -hmm. That belongs right back where most of education does, and that's at the local school district level, where the parents can have a voice in the education their children are getting, and that's where that should be decided. Now, speaking as a parent, I have to say that I think there's reason for concern that, touching on the previous half of this question, because of the concern about separating church and state and so forth, mm -hmm. that that has segued over so far in sex education where it is being taught that there is a total avoidance of any moral connotation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with regard to sex. Mm -hmm. And to teach sex as a purely physical function without taking into consideration the moral precepts that are involved, uh, I think this should be of concern out there at those levels where they are in charge of yeah. education. Just one, a quick footnote on school prayer. Uh, in 19, I understand the issue is more or less dead uh, for the short term, but uh, for 1985, uh, would you be game to go along with Lauren Hatch's suggestion on uh, uh, something to the effect that there be silent prayer? Could you buy that? Well, we could have had this this time. Uh -huh. And no, to me, that is um, evading the issue. Actually, you can have that now. Who in the schoolroom is to know if someone's shut their eyes or bowed their head and, mm -hmm. uh, that they may not just be dozing or contemplating or what? Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me that that suggestion was simply avoiding the issue. And the issue is, did that court decision really violate the First Amendment, not support it. The Constitution is supposed to be neutral on religion. It is not neutral when suddenly that Constitution is interpreted as saying there are certain areas where you cannot uh, do what you might want to do in a religious manner. Mm -hmm. but, you, but you might be able to accept uh, some Orrin Hatch formulation, or am I pushing it? Well, I just think that what we proposed, first of all, we protected and said that this amendment to the Constitution would not permit any public officer or official, and this would include teachers, to concoct a prayer mm -hmm. or force a prayer, nor could it mandate that anyone had to pray or that even the school had to. It simply said that if the people that are in a school want to have a prayer, that's that's their privilege. Uh, and another issue, Mr. President, we know uh, and admire your position on, on reducing the government's involvement in, in people's personal lives. Uh, but the intervention of the Surgeon General uh, into the baby Jane Doe case on Long Island struck some people as good old busy body Uncle Sam acting like Big Brother. Uh, should government be involved in this kind of thing, or is that sort of a special case and you don't see that's going to be any pattern of government activity? Well, you know, the first interest in all of that came about with a baby that was allowed to starve to death uh, because um, it was believed that that baby had such handicaps at its birth that it would not be able to um, have a full and rich life. Uh, there are many people with physical handicaps who have very full and rich lives. Um, and the fact that in this one, they could decide that the baby shouldn't live, but they knew that if they took its life, that would be murder. Mm -hmm. So they stood back and in a sense, technically did not take its life. They just let it starve to death, which took about a week. But in this case in Long Island, you see there is 
in the civil rights, there is a rehabilitation mm -hmm. uh, feature about not discriminating against the handicapped. Mm -hmm. And all the government asked in this case in Long Island was to see the records to see if because of the handicaps with which the child was born, it was being discriminated against in denying it the surgery that mm -hmm. uh, could change some of those handicaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, a court has ruled that uh, no, we, the government couldn't see those records. But this was done in the context of, as I say, the civil rights law regarding the handicap. Well, one, one worry, though, would be that with medical science, as you know, it comes up with some fabulous uh, new operation or whatever almost every week, that the whole business of prolonging, prolonging life beyond a sort of sensible point is likely to arise again and again. I'm just, I just wonder whether you're yes. worried about the government getting involved in every other case and well, so forth. Well, no. no the, the thing is, though, if there's one thing that is a responsibility of the federal government is the guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, there is life, and someone takes it upon themselves to say, uh, uh, we want to cancel that life out, based on our opinion of what uh, that life might become. How do you rectify that, or reconcile that, I should say, with a, a letter that I got from a 24-year-old young lady uh, who is paralyzed from the waist down because of a birth defect? I think at her birth, but her parents did have the operation performed that saved her life. Mm -hmm. And she said she so loves her parents and is so grateful for that decision mm -hmm. and has found her life so rich and rewarding that she's glad <laughs> that decision was made. Mm -hmm. Well, now, as a little baby, she couldn't have made that decision. Right. Someone would have made it for her and they made it the right way in, in favor of life. So th this is a, a situation then where you think that a little bit of government pressure on the, on the side of life probably is a good thing. Yes, can we? Can we have a constitution that says that and then have uh, faced with problems of this kind, uh, uh, can the government say, well, in this case, it doesn't count. Uh, they're not entitled to life. Um, Mr. President, uh, I've been a journalist, uh, it seems, for about four or 500 years. And uh, uh, sometimes the press does things that I don't, uh, I find a little difficult to stomach, and uh, uh, particularly on the question of personal privacy for public officials. It would seem that even the President of the United States is entitled to a bit of it. Uh, but yet you, the, the press is occasionally filled with uh, criticisms of a, of a specious kind, it seems to me. Uh, I saw one press account about uh, saying, how can the President talk about the importance of religion in American life? when uh, the President and Mrs. Reagan don't go to church on Sunday, or, uh, you know, how can you talk about family life because you don't visit your grandchildren every 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> uh, does the press sometimes uh, go too far in looking at the uh, private life of uh, public officials, or, or are these fair points to raise uh, in your view? I don't, think, I don't think it's a fair point to raise when they take from their viewpoint just something they see and they don't have all the facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't have all the facts. Uh, Nancy and I miss going to church very much. And we know why we can't go. Now, some have implied that we didn't ever go, that we, mm -hmm. we did. And uh, when we came here, we started going to church. Mm -hmm. We became self-conscious uh, about the fact that uh, we did kind of, when we arrived on Sunday morning, sort of, I think, detract from the frame of mind that people should mm -hmm. be in when they go to church. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, we were encouraged by the people there. But when it came to a matter of security, and when you look at the barricades that have to be put up around the White House itself, how can we go to church knowing that some terrorist, uh, we could be responsible for causing the death of how many people are in that church mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, by our being there. Mm -hmm. So we can't go. Mm -hmm. But I've been encouraged by some clergymen that I respect very much who have told me that they think that with, in view of that, that uh, it's possible uh, to practice religion 
without that attendance, even though we would like that. And uh, we do. I, after I heard and learned all the series of miracles that intervened to save my life mm -hmm. when I was shot three years ago, I decided uh, whatever time I had left uh, belonged to someone else. I would think uh, that that 1981 experience uh, is something that no one could ever quite block out of their mind. And uh, not that one lives in fear, but it must put, a, a a certain, put things in a certain context. Yes, and uh, if you're out amongst them, you're a little more alert than you might have been before. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, the, uh, another question, Mr. President. Uh, generation gaps are nothing new. Uh, there seems to be at least uh, one generation gap in every family. Uh, your daughter, Patty Davis, has been quoted as saying that arresting people for smoking pot is silly and that living with a boyfriend is as normal as brushing your teeth. Uh, what has to be done with these young people, Mr. President? Uh, or does uh, Patty have a point and maybe the old morality is, well, a little bit old for today's uh, times? I'm just sorry that spanking is <laughs> out of fashion now. <laughs> and, you, and you mean that a bit, don't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, um, the small time values that one learns growing up in a small town, Illinois, uh, which I think may form the core of, of the American conscience and consciousness, do any of these come in handy in Washington or are they just simply irrelevant? I mean, the, the honesty and the openness that you find in a small town, is there a... Oh, I'm, I'm glad that I grew up in a small town. I'm glad that I even went to a small college. Mm -hmm. And if I could recommend it to any young people, I'd tell them to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a... I don't know how to describe all the things that are there. I don't say this, that they're better than people uh, who are living in cities. I don't mean it in that way at all. But I think in a small town where you're not anonymous, mm -hmm. where you're recognized, and just the same when you get to a small campus, mm -hmm. you can't hide. Mm -hmm. You know that you're known. Um, you, uh, there are more things expected of you. For example, in a, in a small school, in a big university, it's so easy for students to just go to class and back to their quarters from class mm -hmm. and not get involved in any of the other outside activities that are also very educational. Mm -hmm. But in a small school, you're needed. So you may have had that in mind that you were just gonna go to school and, and uh, go back to your room or go to class, go back to your room. But no, somebody grabs you by the arm pretty soon and says, hey, we need, <laughs> we need people over here to help with this mm -hmm. or uh, we need cheerleaders or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon you find everyone's involved mm -hmm. and they, they're, they discover things about themselves they might never have discovered. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a drift. The demographic population is drifting, uh, as you know, and the Census Bureau has, has uh, identified the drift into smaller towns and into the suburbs, uh, into the Sun Belt. And I wonder if, in a certain sense, the things that, that you stand for, if you don't feel that, that they are a direct reflection of, uh, of, those, of those values and that people are responding to them as something that's important to have. I think what we're seeing is a swing of the pendulum. Mm -hmm. When I was a young man, over 70% of the people in this country lived in what was small town and rural America. Today, about 75% of America lives in urban uh, centers. We've turned to an urban mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for people to realize that even in the doubling of our population, there are are any number of counties out there, a tremendous number of counties that have a smaller population than they had 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now what we're seeing, I think, is that first the big migration into the cities, and then it didn't live up to what some people wanted for themselves. Right. And with the advent of freeways, transportation, in which it isn't necessary to live next door to where you work and so forth, people are finding they can go back to that mm -hmm. somewhat freer uh, type of life and still uh, even television provides uh, uh, entertainment in the home where you don't have to live where the bright lights are to... Uh, mm -hmm. 
to get culture and entertainment and mm -hmm. so forth. Mr. President, uh, I think that uh, some American, Americans are, are troubled or puzzled uh, when they see their bishop or their, uh, you know, their preacher or whatever get involved in what they regard as political issues. So on the left side, left wing of the Catholic Church, you have not just left wing of the Catholic Church, but left wing of the Church, you have their involvement, and then you have bishops speaking out on the nuclear freeze and so on and so forth. And then on the conservative on the right, you have uh, clergymen speaking out, you know, on so-called moral issues that have a political dimension. Do you think, in a certain sense, the American clergy ought to sort of go back to prayer and stay out of politics and leave that to you, or, or what? No, because in a society like ours, if you start designating professions or trades that should not participate in political discourse, uh, where do you stop? Mm -hmm. uh, I used to face that as an actor. There were many people that said that actors, because they're known and because they can attract an audience, shouldn't be out campaigning for candidates or for causes they believed in, uh, speaking at fundraisers and so forth. And we used to be criticized, and there were people within the profession that said, no, you should do your business is acting up there. You just wait and act. Mm -hmm. and as I said then, and I say about these others, uh, where then would you stop? Who would be the ones that would be permitted mm -hmm. to talk about public issues? Mm -hmm. Now, I do say this because I have disagreed sometimes with uh, some of the more extreme positions taken by some of the, the clergy. Uh, I would say about anyone, if they're going to do that, they have an obligation to really look at both sides mm -hmm. and make sure that they are advising their flock correctly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting that your position in a way on the church state is that in a way we may have overdrawn the line a little bit and you're a little more comfortable with, with clergymen talking about political sure. issues and politicians talking yeah. about religious issues. Yes, to those people who say, to those people who say that a clergyman, uh, you know, well he has an, uh, uh, he can make a bigger, have a bigger effect on, on uh, his perish uh, because of what he is. Mm -hmm. Well then, if you took that, uh, then what about a newspaper publisher? <laughs> what about an anchor man on TV? <laughs> well, I don't think the publisher should be allowed to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, uh, if this is a little bit off the beaten track, but if you were to resign voluntarily sometime in your second term, assuming as, as, as many do that you were reelected, is Mr. Bush uh, ready and able to assume the office of the presidency? Have you trained him well enough? I told him, it is the case of my training him, it's the case of what he's capable of doing. I told an audience last night that I think he's probably the best vice president we've ever had in this country. I believed when I was governor and had a lieutenant governor, and I believe now in this job, that we have over too many years thought of that second in line as someone who was just sitting on the sidelines, uh, uh, you know, looking for signs of ill health <laughs> right. in number one, and uh, until something happened. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I've always believed that they're really like an executive vice president in a corporation, mm -hmm. and uh, they should be used as that. And he is very much a part of everything that goes on uh, in our cabinet, in our administration. He has been in 48 states. He has been in 53 countries. Mm -hmm. um, he was in charge of our project of reducing, and we did successfully, the number of regulations uh, by far, uh, any number of things. I don't know of a vice president who has ever been as much a part of the action as mm -hmm. he is. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly is uh, a pretty, uh a favorable assessment of his abilities. Uh, and that's the way I think people will read it. My final question, according to Michael, is this. Uh, and this is sort of an, an easy one, and it's the kind of question I suppose you expect to be asked after an interview like this. But as you approach the, uh, the conclusion of your, 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 what some, many people think will be only your first term, can you think of two or three things that if you could do it all over again, if God said, OK, Mr. Reagan, you can go back and that January 1, January 1981 and do it all over again and, and so it could come out differently. Two or three things stick in your mind, it's little blips that you wish you could have smoothed out. Well, I'd have gotten in a car quicker on March 30th, <laughs> 1981. <laughs> That's hard to top. <laughs> uh, um, You're not going to be able to top oh, that. There, there. <laughs> no, there, 
I don't know. I've been asked that question know, before. Yeah. And um, uh, always there are things that I don't think of. They're great major things. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, well, they may have to do with major issues, but in the handling of, of your relationship with the uh, trying to get something passed in the, in the Congress, and mm -hmm. you can wish you had or had not done something that you did, but I couldn't just pick out mm -hmm. any glaring or dramatic. But instances. it's been a learning experience. Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Well, thank you very, very much. It's been a great experience for me. Well, thank, thank you. you. I'm honored. Pleased to, pleased to do it. Thank you. Well, we'll send you, we'll only send you about three million copies of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right.